The Haunted House by Charles Dickens, The Ghost in Master B's Room. When I established myself in the triangular garret, which had gained so distinguished a reputation, my thoughts naturally turned to Master B. My speculations about him were uneasy and manifold. Whether his Christian name was Benjamin, Bissextile, from his having been born in Leap Year, Bartholomew, or Bill, whether the initial letter belonged to his family name, and that was Baxter, Black, Brown, Barker, Buggins, Baker, or Bird, whether he was a foundling and had been baptized B, whether he was a lion-hearted boy and B was short for Britain or for Bull, whether he could possibly have been kith and kin to an illustrious lady who brightened my own childhood and had come of the blood of the brilliant Mother Bunch. With these profitless meditations, I tormented myself much. I also carried the mysterious letter into the appearance and pursuits of the deceased, wondering whether he dressed in blue, wore boots, he couldn't have been bald, was a boy of brains, liked books, was good at bowling, had any skill as a boxer, even in his buoyant boyhood bathed from a bathing machine at Bognor, Bangor, Bournemouth, Brighton, or broad stairs, like a bounding billiard ball? So from the first, I was haunted by the letter B. It was not long before I remarked that I never by any hazard had a dream of Master B or of anything belonging to him. But the instant I awoke from sleep at whatever hour of the night, my thoughts took him up and roamed away, trying to attach his initial letter to something that would fit it and keep it quiet. For six nights, I had been worried this in Master B's room, when I began to perceive that things were going wrong. The first appearance that presented itself was early in the morning, when it was but just daylight and no more. I was standing, shaving at my glass, when I suddenly discovered, to my consternation and amazement, that I was shaving, not myself, I am 50, but a boy. Apparently, Master B. I trembled and looked over my shoulder, nothing there. I looked again in the glass and distinctly saw the features and expression of a boy who was shaving, not to get rid of a beard, but to get one. Extremely troubled in my mind, I took a few turns in the room and went back to the looking glass, resolved to steady my hand and complete the operation in which I had been disturbed. Opening my eyes, which I had shut while recovering my firmness, I now met in the glass, looking straight at me, the eyes of a young man of four or five and twenty. Terrified by this new ghost, I closed my eyes and made a strong effort to recover myself. Opening them again, I saw, shaving his cheek in the glass, my father, who has long been dead. Nay, I even saw my grandfather, too, whom I never did see in my life." Although naturally much affected by these remarkable visitations, I determined to keep my secret until the time agreed upon for the present general disclosure. Agitated by a multitude of curious thoughts, I retired to my room that night, prepared to encounter some new experience of a spectral character. Nor was my preparation needless, for, waking from an uneasy sleep at exactly two o'clock in the morning, what were my feelings to find that I was sharing my bed with the skeleton of Master B? I sprang up, and the skeleton sprang up also. I then heard a plaintive voice saying, Where am I? What has become of me? And, looking hard in that direction, perceived the ghost of Master B. The young specter was dressed in an obsolete fashion, or rather was not so much dressed as put into a case of inferior pepper and salt cloth made horrible by means of shining buttons. I observed that these buttons went in a double row over each shoulder of the young ghost and appeared to descend his back. He wore a frill round his neck. His right hand, which I distinctly noticed to be inky, was laid upon his stomach connecting this action with some feeble pimples on his countenance and his general air of nausea, I concluded this ghost to be the ghost of a boy who had habitually taken a great deal too much medicine. Where am I, said the little specter, in a pathetic voice. 
And why was I born in the calomel days? And why did I have all that calomel given me? I replied with sincere earnestness that upon my soul, I couldn't tell him. Where is my little sister? said the ghost. And where my angelic little wife? And where is the boy I went to school with? I entreated the phantom to be comforted and above all things to take heart respecting the loss of the boy he went to school with. I represented to him that probably that boy never did within human experience come out well when discovered. I urged that I myself had in later life turned up several boys whom I went to school with and none of them had at all answered. I expressed my humble belief that that boy never did answer. I represented that he was a mythic character, a delusion, and a snare. I recounted how, the last time I found him, I found him at a dinner party behind a wall of white cravat with an inconclusive opinion on every possible subject and a power of silent boredom absolutely titanic. I related how, on the strength of our having been together at Old Doylance's, he had asked himself to breakfast with me, a social offense of the largest magnitude, how, fanning my weak embers of belief in Doylance's boys, I had let him in, and how he had proved to be a fearful wanderer about the earth, pursuing the race of Adam with inexplicable notions concerning the currency, and with a proposition that the Bank of England should, on pain of being abolished, instantly strike off and circulate God knows how many thousand millions of ten and sixpenny notes. The ghost heard me in silence, and with a fixed stare. Barber, it apostrophized me when I had finished. Barber, I repeated, for I am not of that profession. Condemned, said the ghost, to shave a constant change of customers. Now me, now a young man, now thyself as thou art. Now thy father, now thy grandfather. Condemned, too, to lie down with a skeleton every night and to rise with it every morning. I shuddered on hearing this dismal announcement. Barber, pursue me. I had felt, even before the words were uttered, that I was under a spell to pursue the phantom. I immediately did so and was in Master B's room no longer. Most people know what long and fatiguing night journeys had been forced upon the witches who used to confess, and who, no doubt, told the exact truth, particularly as they were always assisted with leading questions, and the torture was always ready. I assever it that, during my occupation of Master B's room, I was taken by the ghosts that haunted it on expeditions fully as long and wild as any of those. Assuredly, I was presented to no shabby old man with a goat's horns and tail, something between Pan and an old clothesman, holding conventional receptions as stupid as those of real life and less decent, but I came upon other things which appeared to me to have more meaning. Confident that I speak the truth and shall be believed, I declare without hesitation that I followed the ghost in the first instance on a broomstick and afterwards on a rocking horse. The very smell of the animal's paint, especially when I brought it out by making him warm, I am ready to swear it. I followed the ghost afterwards in a hackney coach, an institution with the peculiar smell of which the present generation is unacquainted, but to which I am again ready to swear as a combination of stable, dog with the mange, and very old bellows. In this, I appeal to previous generations to confirm or refute me. I pursued the phantom on a headless donkey, at least upon a donkey who was so interested in the state of his stomach that his head was always down, investigating it, on ponies expressly born to kick up behind, on roundabouts and swings, from fairs, in the first cab, another forgotten institution where the fair regularly got into bed, and was tucked up with the driver." Not to trouble you with a detailed account of all my travels in pursuit of the ghost of Master B, which were longer and more wonderful than those of Sinbad the Sailor, I will confine myself to one experience from which you may judge of many. I was marvelously changed. I was myself, yet not myself. I was conscious of something within me, which has been the same all through my life, and which I have always recognized under all its phases and varieties as never altering. And yet I was not the I who had gone to bed in Master B's room. I had the smoothest of faces and the shortest of legs, and I had taken another creature like myself also with the smoothest of faces and the shortest of legs, 
behind a door and was confiding to him a proposition of the most astounding nature. That proposition was that we should have a seraglio. The other creature assented warmly. He had no notion of respectability, neither had I. It was the custom of the East. It was the way of the good Caliph Harun al Ashid. Let me have the corrupted name again for once. It is so scented with sweet memories. The usage was highly laudable and most worthy of imitation. Oh, yes, let us, said the other creature with a jump. Have a seraglio. It was not because we entertained the faintest doubts of the meritorious character of the Oriental establishment we proposed to import that we perceived it must be kept a secret from Miss Griffin. It was because we knew Miss Griffin to be bereft of human sympathies and incapable of appreciating the greatness of the great Harun. Mystery impenetrably shrouded from Miss Griffin, then let us entrust it to Miss Boole. We were 10 in Miss Griffin's establishment by Hampstead Ponds, eight ladies and two gentlemen. Miss Buell, whom I judged to have attained the ripe age of eight or nine, took the lead in society. I opened the subject to her in the course of the day and proposed that she should become the favorite. Miss Buell, after struggling with the diffidence so natural to and charming in her adorable sex, expressed herself as flattered by the idea but wished to know how it was proposed to provide for Miss Pipson. Miss Buell, who was understood to have vowed towards that young lady a friendship, halves and no secrets until death on the church service and lessons complete in two volumes with case and lock, Miss Buell said she could not, as the friend of Miss Pipson, disguise from herself or me that Pipson was not one of the common. Now, Miss Pipson, having curly hair and blue eyes, which was my idea of anything mortal and feminine that was called fair, I promptly replied that I regarded Miss Pipson in the light of a fair Circassian. And what then? Miss Buell pensively asked. I replied that she must be inveigled by a merchant, brought to me veiled, and purchased as a slave. The other creature had already fallen into the second male place in the state and was set apart for Grand Vizier. He afterwards resisted this disposal of events, but had his hair pulled until he yielded. Shall I not be jealous? Miss Buell inquired, casting down her eyes. Zobid, no, I replied. You will ever be the favorite sultana. The first place in my heart and on my throne will be ever yours." Miss Buell, upon that assurance, consented to propound the idea of her seven beautiful companions. It occurred to me, in the course of the same day, that we knew we could trust a grinning and good-natured soul called Tabby, who was the serving drudge of the house and had no more figure than one of the beds, and upon whose face there was always more or less black lead. I slipped into Miss Buell's hand after supper a little note to that effect dwelling on the black lead as being in a manner deposited by the finger of providence pointing tabby out for miss Ruhr, the celebrated chief of the blacks of the harem there were difficulties in the formation of the desired institution as there are in all combinations the other creature showed himself of a low character and when defeated in aspiring to the throne pretended to have conscientious scruples about prostrating himself before the caliph wouldn't call him commander of the faithful, spoke of him slightingly and inconsistently as a mere chap, said he, the other creature, wouldn't play, play, and was otherwise coarse and offensive. This meanness of disposition was, however, put down by the general indignation of an united seraglio, and I became blessed in the smiles of eight of the fairest of the daughters of men. The smiles could only be bestowed when Miss Griffin was looking another way, and only then in a very wary manner, for there was a legend among the followers of the prophet that she saw with a little round ornament in the middle of the pattern on the back of her shawl. But every day after dinner, for an hour, we were all together, and then the favorite and the rest of the royal harem competed who should most beguile the leisure of the serene Harun reposing from the cares of state which were generally, as in most affairs of state, of an arithmetical character, the commander of the faithful being a fearful boggler at a sum. On these occasions, the devoted Mesrur, chief of the blacks of the harem, was always in attendance, Miss Griffin usually ringing for that officer at the same time with great vehemence, but never acquitted himself in a manner worthy of his historical reputation. 
In the first place, his bringing a broom into the divan of the caliph, even when Harun wore on his shoulders the red robe of anger, Miss Pipson's police, though it might be got over for the moment, was never to be quite satisfactorily accounted for. In the second place, his breaking out into grinning exclamations of Lord Cupridis was neither Eastern nor respectful. In the third place, when specially instructed to say Bismillah, he always said Hallelujah. This officer, unlike his class, was too good-humored altogether, kept his mouth open far too wide, expressed approbation to an incongruous extent, and even once, it was on the occasion of the purchase of the fair Circassian for 500,000 purses of gold and cheap too, embraced the slave, the favorite, and the caliph all around. Parenthetically, let me say, God bless Miss Ruhr, and may there have been sons and daughters on that tender bosom, softening many a hard day since. Miss Griffin was a model of propriety, and I am at a loss to imagine what the feelings of the virtuous woman would have been if she had known, when she paraded us down Hampstead Road two and two, that she was walking with a stately step at the head of polygamy and Mohammedanism. I believe that a mysterious and terrible joy with which the contemplation of Miss Griffin in this unconscious state inspired us, and a grim sense prevalent among us that there was a dreadful power in our knowledge of what Miss Griffin, who knew all things that could be learned out of a book, didn't know, were the mainspring of the preservation of our secret. It was wonderfully kept, but was once upon the verge of self-betrayal. The danger and escape occurred upon a Sunday. We were all ten ranged in a conspicuous part of the gallery at church, with Miss Griffin at our head, as we were every Sunday, advertising the establishment in an unsecular sort of way, when the description of Solomon in his domestic glory happened to be read. The moment that Marnock was thus referred to, conscience whispered me, Thou too, Harun. The officiating minister had a cast in his eye, and it assisted conscience by giving him the appearance of reading personally at me. A crimson blush, attended by a fearful perspiration, suffused my features. The grand vizier became more dead than alive, and the whole seraglio reddened, as if the sunset of Baghdad shone directly upon their lovely faces. At this portentous time, the awful griffin rose, and balefully surveyed the children of Islam. My own impression was that church and state had entered into a conspiracy with Miss Griffin to expose us, and that we should all be put into white sheets and exhibited in the center aisle. But so westerly, if I may be allowed the expression as opposed to eastern associations, was Miss Griffin's sense of rectitude, that she merely suspected apples, and we were saved. I have called the seraglio united. Upon the question solely whether the commander of the faithful dust exercise a right of kissing in that sanctuary of the palace, were its peerless inmates divided. Zobeid asserted a counter right in the favorite to scratch, and the fair Circassian put her face for refuge into a green baize bag originally designed for books. On the other hand, a young antelope of transcendent beauty from the fruitful plains of Camden Town, whence she had been brought by traders in the half-yearly caravan that crossed the intermediate desert after the holidays, held more liberal opinions, but stipulated for limiting the benefit of them to that dog and son of a dog, the Grand Vizier, who had no rights and was not in question. At length, the difficulty was compromised by the installation of a very youthful slave as deputy. She, raised upon a stool, officially received upon her cheeks the salutes intended by the gracious Harun for other sultanas, and was privately rewarded from the coffers of the ladies of the harem. And now it was at the full height of enjoyment of my bliss that I became heavily troubled. I began to think of my mother and what she would say to my taking home at Midsummer Eight of the most beautiful of the daughters of men, but all unexpected. I thought of the number of beds we made up at our house, of my father's income, and of the baker, and my despondency redoubled. The seraglio and malicious vizier, divining the cause of their lord's unhappiness, did their utmost to augment it. They professed unbounded fidelity and declared that they would live and die with it, with him. Reduced to the utmost wretchedness by these protestations of attachment, I lay awake for hours at a time 
ruminating on my frightful lot. In my despair, I think I might have taken an early opportunity of falling on my knees before Miss Griffin, avowing my resemblance to Solomon, and praying to be dealt with according to the outraged laws of my country, if an unthought of means of escape had not opened before me. One day, we were out walking, two and two, on which occasion the vizier had his usual instructions to take note of the boy at the turnpike. And if he profanely gazed, which he always did, at the beauties of the harem, to have him bowstrung in the course of the night, and it happened that our hearts were veiled in gloom. An unaccountable action on the part of the antelope had plunged the state into disgrace. That charmer, on the representation that the previous day was her birthday, and that vast treasures had been sent in a hamper for its celebration, both baseless assertions, had secretly but most pressingly invited 35 neighboring princes and princesses to a ball and supper, with a special stipulation that they were not to be fetched till 12. This wandering of the antelope's fancy led to the surprising arrival at Miss Griffin's door in diverse equipages and under various escorts of a great company in full dress who were deposited on the top step in a flush of high expectancy, and who were dismissed in tears. At the beginning of the double knocks attendant on these ceremonies, the antelope had retired to a back attic and bolted herself in, and at every new arrival, Miss Griffin had gone so much more and more distracted that at last she had been seen to tear her front. Ultimate capitulation on the part of the offender had been followed by solitude in the linen closet, bread and water, and a lecture to all, of vindictive length in which Miss Griffin had used expressions. Firstly, I believe you, all of you, knew it. Secondly, every one of you is as wicked as another. Thirdly, a pack of little wretches. Under these circumstances, we were walking drearily along, and I especially, with my Muslim responsibilities heavy on me, was in a very low state of mind when a strange man accosted Miss Griffin and, after walking on at her side for a little while and talking with her, looked at me. Supposing him to be a minion of the law and that my hour was come, I instantly ran away with the general purpose of making for Egypt. The whole seraglio cried out when they saw me making off as fast as my legs would carry me. I had an impression that the first turning on the left and round by the public house would be the shortest way to the pyramids. Miss Griffin screamed after me, The faithless vizier ran after me, and the boy at the turnpike dodged me into a corner like a sheep and cut me off. Nobody scolded me when I was taken and brought back. Miss Griffin only said, with a stunning gentleness, this was very curious. Why had I run away when the gentleman looked at me? If I had had any breath to answer with, I dare say I should have made no answer, having no breath. I certainly made none. Miss Griffin and the strange man took me between them, and walked me back to the palace in a sort of state, but not at all, as I couldn't help feeling with astonishment, in culprit state. When we got there, we went into a room by ourselves, and Miss Griffin called in to her assistance, Mesrur, chief of the dusky guards of the harem. Mesrur, on being whispered to, began to shed tears. Bless you, my precious, said that officer, turning to me. Your pause took bitter bad. I asked with a fluttered heart, is he very ill? Lord, temper the wind to you, my lamb, said the good Mesrur, kneeling down, that I might have a comforting shoulder for my head to rest on. Your paws dead. Harun al took to flight at the words, the seraglio vanished. From that moment, I never again saw one of the eight of the fairest of the daughters of men. I was taken home, and there was debt at home as well as death, and we had a sail there. My own little bed was so superciliously looked upon by a power unknown to me, hazily called the trade, that a brass coal scuttle, a roasting jack, and a birdcage were obliged to be put into it to make a lot of it, and then it went for a song. So I heard mentioned, and I wondered what song, and thought what a dismal song it must have been to sing. Then I was sent to a great, cold, bare school of big boys, where everything to eat and wear was thick and clumpy, without being enough, where everybody, large and small, was cruel, 
where the boys knew all about the sale before I got there and asked me what I had fetched and who had bought me and hooted at me, going, going, gone. I never whispered in that wretched place that I had been Harun or had had a seriglio, for I knew that if I mentioned my reverses, I should be so worried that I should have to drown myself in the muddy pond near the playground, which looked like the beer. Ah me, ah me. No other ghost has haunted the boys' room, my friends, since I have occupied it, than the ghost of my own childhood, the ghost of my own innocence, the ghost of my own airy belief. Many a time have I pursued the phantom, never with this man's stride of mine to come up with it, never with these man's hands of mine to touch it, never more to this man's heart of mine to hold it in its purity. And here you see me working out as cheerfully and thankfully as I may, my doom of shaving in the glass, a constant change of customers, and of lying down and rising up with the skeleton allotted to me for my mortal companion.